Hey folks, Pixel Pedden here on a very special day, because today I am taking a look at the TI-99-4. In 1979, the world's first 16-bit home computer, and TI's kind of disastrous debut on the home computer market, two years before the release of their more successful TI-99-4A. Thanks to a really, really rocky launch, the TI-99-4 was rare even at its peak. But it's even harder to get your hands on one nowadays. Which is too bad, since, well, it's such a cool piece of computing history. Happily, though, I have one here, so we're gonna get a look at the machine and take a look at what happened to the TI-99-4. Apologies in advance for the quality of the screen capture for this one. I just don't have the heart to RGB mod my 99.4, given its graphics chip is one of the most unique things about it. So, we're working with NTSC video here in all its grody glory. There's a fair bit about the 99.4 that's going to seem pretty weird if you're familiar with the TI-99.4A. And that weirdness is really what I want to dig into today, since the 99.4's idiosyncrasies don't really get talked about a whole lot, even among TI-99 fans. But honestly, there are some good reasons the 99.4 doesn't get talked about. The main reason just being how few 99.4s there are out there. We don't know precisely how many 99.4s were sold, but the best estimates we have are in the 20 to 25,000 range. So to put that in perspective, over 100 TI-99.4As sold for every one TI-99.4. The other reason the 99.4 mostly gets lost in the background of history is just that the 99.4A made some really appealing changes that were hard to pass up once they were there. The most important addition being a proper goddamn keyboard. But naturally, it's the 2020s. And these days, an early 80s microcomputer being weird, crazy, and impractical kind of just makes it more interesting. It kind of just encourages us. And the 99.4 is all of those things. So, let's take a look at what the TI-99.4 had to offer for the first folks to jump on the TI bandwagon in 1979. Unfortunately, the story of the 99.4 really starts with what it didn't have to offer yet in its first two years as TI's flagship home computer. In the long run, the peripheral expansion box was the standard solution for TI-99 expansion, giving you all your essentials, like RAM expansion, disks, and RS-232. But the PEB wasn't available until 1982. After production on the 99.4, it already ended. On the 99.4, in its own time, you had sidecar expansion units, if you were lucky enough to find them, and even those were slow to release and hard to come by. Plus, in the long run, Extended Basic was the top high-level language on the TI-99, but XB wasn't available until 1981. On the 99.4, in its own time, the basic you had was the basic built into ROM. Then, in the long run, for assembly software development, 99ers had a few options. TI Editor Assembler was the standard dev package, but that didn't arrive until 1982. So, not much use to early adopters of the 99.4. And there was also Mini Memory which let you experiment with assembly even on an unupgraded TI-99. But that was another 82 release. At the release of the 99.4 itself, there was none of that. There was just good old bad old TI Basic. So there's the bad news. But obviously, TI didn't just release the 99.4 with no software and no way to make more of it. They came close, but not quite. The 99.4 did have a release library, and that debuted at Summer CES 1979, where game titles included a few options from Milton Bradley. The so-called Game Vision carts included Yahtzee, Connect 4, Zero Zap, and Hangman. And none of those is a real arcade-style action game, so not a great way to show off everything the 99.4 was capable of. But they did at least give a good demo of the 99.4's sound capabilities. Other 
other early titles are mostly just the kinds of carts we use these days as donors. When we need a shell for a homebrew cart, but we really don't need what's inside it right now. Things like home financial decisions, household budget management, and physical fitness. Though Video Chess at least was a solid chess game that TI was able to promote right off the bat. So, that's something. Yeah, out of the starting gate, the 99.4 software selection was not much to look at. Though it got better as time went on. And one demo from 1980 that did take things further was TI Trek. That Super Star Trek style game used the 99.4's disc controller and speech synthesizer sidecars and the speech editor cartridge. And if you had all of that, could show off the system's ability to play arbitrary digital speech samples. Computer firing laser at Klingon. So the software did occasionally manage to put the hardware through its paces in the 99.4's own time, before the 99.4A showed up on the scene. But the biggest thing holding back the 99.4 in 79 and 80 wasn't anything it was missing. It was actually something it included. A color monitor. Or really, just a modified Zenith TV at first. TI hadn't been able to get regulatory approval for an RF modulator in time, so they'd sold the 99.4 with a composite monitor instead. And that brought the package price up to $1,150 when all was said and done. TI did eventually get an RF modulator approved, and that came standard with the 99.4A later on. But for 99.4 early adopters, there was no using RF to connect your new 99.4 to the plain old RF-only TV you already had in your living room. Now in the 99.4's defense, needing a composite monitor didn't make it a worse computer. In the long run, RF gave way to composite regardless. So outputting composite video and analog audio directly and separately is really what we wanted in the end. And when it comes to dealing with those separately, the 99.4 actually goes one step further than the 99.4a, since many 99.4s, including my own, have a front headphone jack. And I think this is actually kind of a handy feature, since, like a lot of 80s composite monitors, mine doesn't have speakers, so sound needs to be dealt with separately anyway, which means it might as well go straight to my ears. And the 99.4 makes that easy. And some 99.4s even go one step further and add a volume slider too. And yet other units even add an internal speaker whose output is controlled by that slider. But in the end, the volume slider's impact on the platform didn't have anything to do with volume at all. Its major consequence in the long run was the solid state software badge that replaced it on most 99.4s and a lot of 4As too. And I think it looks pretty slick there. So, I'm pretty happy with that net result, I guess. But when people talk about TI-99.4 hardware, the one thing that gets talked about just about every time is the keyboard. And that keyboard definitely is an experience. If you've used a TI-99.4A, get ready for a wild ride, and forget everything you know about typing on a TI-99. Now obviously, the TI-99.4 keyboard is a chiclet keyboard. And that's the first thing you'll always hear said about it. But it's only 10 keys wide and 4 rows deep. Same as a ZX81 or a Spectrum keyboard. So the way you use it is also completely different from the way you use a 99.4A keyboard. First off, some characters you can type on a TI-99.4A are just missing from the keyboard now. There's no tilde or backslash on the 99.4 board, for example. The weirdest thing about this keyboard, though, is really just that it has a shift key, but no case distinction. The shift key is really just a function key. It has no case shift function. For some of the keys, it lets you type a special character, like an equal sign or a question mark. And for others, it has a function like delete or insert. So the way the 99.4 does everything other than typing alphanumeric characters is pretty utterly different. On a 99.4A keyboard, you put a keyboard strip above the keyboard, and you'll use the function and control key combinations to perform all the special functions used by complicated programs like Multiplan or TI Writer. But on the 99.4, the shift key's got to do all that by itself, on a keyboard where there already aren't many unused key combos. 
But to help you remember what special functions there are, the 99.4 gives you keyboard overlays. Those do the same thing as keyboard strips did on the 99.4a. Though personally, I've just labeled each of the default functions on the keybed itself instead of using the default overlay. Seems a little more elegant to me. The default functions should really just always be there, it seems to me. There are a couple more odd things about the keyboard. For one thing, we've got a space button at the left side of the keyboard, but also a space bar that already does that. And on a keyboard with not a lot of keys, a redundant one seems like a weird move. Finally, our Enter key is on the bottom row instead of the home row. And since there's just nothing to the right of the JKL keys, your right pinky has nothing to sit on. And that is way more confusing than you might think. If you're used to touch typing, you're used to hunting for the home row. And the home row isn't supposed to be three keys wide. Plus, there's nothing on the keys to differentiate them by touch. They've all got the same mold. And just to make things even worse, there's the pointless space key to the left of A. So the natural place you'll end up if you navigate by touch is always going to be space ASD on the left and HJKL on the right. My solution was I built myself another key out of thermoplastic and mounted it in the pinky position. I gather TI themselves did this on some later overlays. Putting a phantom key on the overlay to make the keyboard less infuriating to use. And it's definitely necessary. Even once you do that, though, well, the keyboard's still infuriating. Another frustration being that there's no tactile response at the contact point, so you don't really know when the key's been pressed. And since the keystrokes repeat really insanely fast on the 99.4, Preventing repeated keystrokes is really hard. Hold down a key for half a second, and you've typed it a few times already. So the keyboard's awful in a few different ways, and doesn't really have all the keys you need to do everything you'd like. But there's another really big difference inside of the case on the 99.4 motherboard. And that's the TMS9918 VDP. It's graphics chip. The 99.4 uses the first version of TI's hugely popular graphics chip, and this particular one wasn't used on any other systems. The 99.18 is the granddaddy of the family. And the upshot of that is the 99.4 can't do everything the 4A can do, with its own 99.18A update to that chip. Specifically, the 99.18 doesn't offer bitmap mode graphics. And that means a big chunk of the TI-99 library isn't compatible. Try to play Parsec on the 99.4, and it'll just reset to the start screen. Might be nice if it displayed an error instead. Something along the lines of, It's 1982, why the hell are you still using a 99.4? But, you know, I guess a reset will do. The 99.18 is definitely a downside if you're using a 99.4 today. But, in the machine's defense, it really wasn't a downside in the 99.4's own time, since there weren't any games using bitmap mode anyway. And even once the 4A came out, most games still weren't using bitmap graphics, and ran fine on a 99.4. So the 99.4 isn't entirely forward compatible with the later TI-99.4A library. But on the other hand, there are cases where this runs in the other direction. Because 99.4 Basic doesn't support a case distinction, and is missing a few other special characters, it uses fewer patterns in VDP memory. And since TI Basic uses VDP memory for program storage, there's more program space there to be used. Which means 99.4 Basic programs can be exactly 256 bytes larger than 99.4A Basic programs. And a 99.4 program may fail to run on a 99.4a, due to memory limitations. Another difference you'll notice in BASIC on the 99.4 is just that the character set is different from the one on the 4a. The characters are a 5x6 font, in an uppercase style on the 99.4, where on the 4a, uppercase characters are 5x7, and you've got a lowercase set as well. There's some convenience appeal to the 5x6 font, I think. Since with the characters padded on all sides, you never have to worry about spacing. There's always at least a pixel on every side of every letter. And that creates another situation where the 99.4 basic software might not run ideally on a 4A. 
Since any software that assumes it's working with the 5x6 font with one pixel padding is going to be spaced incorrectly on a 4a. The last and biggest difference you run into starting up your 99.4 for the first time is the extra option that shows up in the startup menu. Equation Calculator. There's nothing too exciting here. Equation Calculator gives you a space for doing some basic calculations. But, in the long run, it doesn't give you anything that basic doesn't. It just gives you a built-in calculation interface. You can store equations in the Equation field in the middle of the screen and use them whenever you need them. You can set variable values, which get displayed in the variable memory box, and use those in your equations. All the same math functions available in BASIC are on hand here. So it's got what it needs to be a capable calculator, but, well, it also doesn't really do a great job of justifying its existence when BASIC does the same thing right next door. It even uses the same new and by keywords BASIC uses to start a new calculation or to leave the program. If you ever happen to get yourself a TI-99-4, one more hardware difference to keep in mind is the difference between the power supplies the different revisions use. Later 99.4s use the same 4-prong AC adapter as the 99.4A, but some earlier ones use a DC adapter, and you'll fry them if you try to use them with the 4A's AC supply. So don't. These things are rare enough as it is. Anyway, there you have it. A revolutionary 16-bit computer with a legendarily bad keyboard. A system that TI just wasn't able to bring to market in sufficient quantities, with enough hardware and software support for it, for the machine to really go places. But it did get where it needed to go with the TI-99 4E in 1981. And that's why when someone says TI-99 today, they almost definitely mean the 99 4A because the 99.4 was just more interesting than it was useful. But, like I said earlier, in vintage computing, useful tends to take a backseat to interesting. And the 99.4 is certainly interesting. Thanks for joining me on this quick trip through early TI-99 history, where typing is torture, but colorful graphics and voice synth and sound are on offer from the 99.4. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more of my TI-99 content, just hit subscribe. Thanks for watching, as always, and a special thanks to the likes of Jim Fetzner, Greg McGill, Lee Stewart, and others in the TI-99 community for their insights on some of the early TI-99 history we talked about here. Time for me to go rediscover the joys of typing with a full travel keyboard on my TI-99 4A. See you next time.